and today we are doing a webinar here on um, hiring an ISA, OSI, should I or shouldn't I? Basically, this webinar is really geared towards helping you learn more about the model and the different types of systems and infrastructure that's going to be utilized so that you can make a better decision as to whether or not you want to pursue utilizing an ISA or OSA in your business. Um, I'm excited about today's webinar because we're actually utilizing a new platform new to us at MAPS Group Coaching. So bear with me as there might be some jumping around back and forth, but hopefully with this um, platform, you're able to type in questions as we go throughout and I can answer those for you. If not, I do apologize. I will um, have my contact information available to you should you have any questions outside of the webinar. Okay, so let's get started. Hiring an ISA, OSA, should I or shouldn't I? Let's make sure we're both on the same page here. First, I want us to make sure we're using these terms um, in the same way so that we can best understand what we're talking about. I am guilty of utilizing these terms incorrectly. So ISA is an inside sales agent or associate. Uh, they are predominantly geared towards inbound leads. So all leads that are coming in, whether it's via email, web registrations, sign calls, things like that. Predominantly, our inbound leads typically tend to be our buyer leads. Okay. Then we have our OSA, our outside sales agent associate. They are uh, dedicated to calling out, prospecting outbound for leads. Predominantly, we focus on seller leads when we make these type of outbound calls. Now, I am notorious for um, calling OSAs ISAs, okay? And what I have um, learned growing up in, not growing up, I didn't grow up in real estate, but once I joined the real estate community in 2013, we constantly referred to outbound sales associates as ISAs, and we referred to um, ISAs as inbound lead coordinators. So I apologize if my um, language changes. I will try to correct myself and make sure we're all speaking the same language. Okay, so let's jump into it further then. Your decision on whether or not you will want to bring in an ISA, OSA uh, division of your company is largely going to be based off the following factors. It's going to be based off your budget, your team, the time you have available to leverage, or the time you have available to uh, train is another way to consider it. The goals of your company, your team, yourself, and your focus, the level of focus you can provide. Okay, and so we're going to dive into this a little deeper throughout the webinar. First, let's talk about infrastructure. Here are some things to think about. How will you supply the ISAs, OSAs with leads? What is the cost of that? How will the lead then be managed? What does your CRM look like, standards and procedures? How will the lead be converted? What's the interaction going to be like between the agent and the ISA, OSA? And then furthermore, how will the lead be serviced? Agent and admin systems. So my goal is to really dive into these to give you a better perspective as to whether or not you're ready right now to bring in an ISA OSA or it's something that's interesting enough to you that you'd want to pursue further and you can start to work on these types of um, infrastructure. All right, lead generation cost. So here's a couple of different <clears throat> lead costs. We've got our sphere, our sign calls, circle prospecting, expired home valuation, IDX, Zillow, radio. Sphere, that's pretty straightforward. That's the people who you already know, like, and trust that you have their phone number, contact information. It's free for you to call them. They're your friends and family. Sign calls, that is the next uh, most cheapest type of uh, lead because really you have a one time fee for the sign. Once you put it up anywhere, there it is, and you will get interested buyers calling in. Circle prospecting. Um, this is where you are essentially calling neighborhoods um, to identify potential sellers. That's the main goal. You might come across a buyer, fantastic, but the main goal here is to identify sellers. Um, the challenge with this is it's definitely a situation in where 
you will have to make a lot of calls to find that one seller. You're not calling expired for sale by owners that have already raised their hand. The benefit here though is less skill is necessary. You are typically gonna be very conversational, laid back in your communication, and typically the seller that you identify is not already in relationship or being prospected by another agent, okay? Then you have your expired for sale by owner, pretty straightforward there. Home valuation, those are ads that you pay for uh, that are sent out to people saying, find out what your home is worth. Then you have IDX, right? That's the uh, on your website where you have um, a link to the MLS and people can search and look and see. They have to register first to get access. Then we have Zillow, Trulio, Realtor.com, those type of aggregator sites. Those are costing us anywhere from $50 to $250 a lead. This one specifically varies because um, it's dependent on your market. Obviously, uh, some, some cities have quite a lot more expense associated with the Zillow lead than other cities. So that's something to consider. And then the more costly uh, lead generation is going to be radio, billboard, commercial. Okay. So that's a general idea of cost. It's often related to availability of lead sources. So I included this here in the slide just to give you a reference. Sphere sign calls expired. Those are limited. You only get, you only have so many people listed in your sphere. You only have so many signs out on the um, town and there's only so many expired for sale by owners a day. Radio it's a little less limited, but still not everybody is listening to radio or that station or at that specific time. Zillow, IDX, home valuation, circle prospecting, that's where you start hitting more unlimited fields, right? Zillow, you're capturing, you're capturing buyers all over the internet as well as IDX and home valuation, circle prospecting. You are just continuously calling neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood until you call the whole city. Okay. Now, the reason why I have these slides in place is because I want you to start to calculate what your budget's going to be. Here are some other expenses. Auto dialer, right? If you're giving your ISA, OSA the tools to succeed at a high level, they often require an auto dialer to call through the numbers efficiently. Um, training, they will need some type of training. And whether it's you training them, that is your time and your time is money or you outsource it to other programs or invest in some different different professional classes for that person. And then your CRM, right? How much is all of this costing you? Do you already have it in place? Um, but in general, based off of the Millionaire Real Estate Agent Handbook, we allocate 10% of our GCI to the lead generation budget. Okay, so when we say budget down here, that's the budget. It's 10% to lead generation. Now, a quick and easy exercise that you can do is look at 2017. Take a look at your performance last year. Look at what your GCI was. Take 10% of that, and that would be your allocation for this year. Then ask yourself, where is my money going? Where am I investing? Is it marketing? Is it prospect base? And how much is it? If you are outside of 10%, you're typically considered to be overspending on lead gen. And you really want to reevaluate those numbers because your lead gen spend should be giving you a 10x return. So you want to track down of my marketing. How is that paid off? How many deals can I directly attribute to the marketing? How many deals can I directly attribute to this prospecting cost, right? Tracking is going to be incredibly important as you grow your business. It's important whether or not you have an ISA or an OSA division. However, when you start to invest in other people, it becomes even more important to be able to assess their performance in the overall health of your business. So I can't say enough about tracking and having that in place. All right, so just a reminder, 10% of your budget is dedicated to lead generation. And we're going to go, we're going to touch on that a little bit more through the webinar. Okay, so we've talked about helping you determine how much your lead gen is going to cost you. Do you have it in the budget? Is it something available to you to start doing immediately? Or is it something you need to work towards next year? 
once you determine if you've got the budget for it, then you need to determine, do you have the systems in place to manage the leads? So here are some overarching concepts to really drill down. How are you currently utilizing your CRM? Are, first of all, let's get real here, guys. Are any of you not using your CRM, right? Could happen. Um, I know that it's very challenging for agents to stay organized. Typically, a lot of agents out there that are doing really well converting clients and and um, managing their, their clients often struggle with the organization piece of the business. They got into real estate to sell real estate, and this other stuff can be overwhelming to them. I totally get it. However, if you intend to expand your business, you need to have a focus around it. It may be that you can leverage this out if you have the financial means to do so or not. But either way, the way I look at it is your ISA OSA is only going to be as successful as the systems and structure you have in place for them. Okay, I'm going to say it again. Your ISA OSA is only going to be as successful and bring you as much benefit as the system and structure you have in place for them to succeed. All right. So first step is getting a CRM and utilizing it and then being on the same page with everyone on your team as to how you utilize it. So one of the first steps that we do that we want to accomplish is defining a lead. All right. We want to define what actually goes into the CRM so that we don't start creating a CRM full of junk. The term lead is used very loosely within the industry. It has a lot of different definitions, right? Um, I always give this example. My dad, love him to pieces. He's constantly giving me air quotes here. Leads. My dad is constantly giving me leads, except his leads are often terrible. It is the teenage beverage cart girl at the country club who is in college who could not qualify for a loan if she tried, right? Or it's um, a friend of a friend of a friend's friend who's complaining about uh, their rent but doesn't have a stable income to support a loan. So that is not what I would consider a true lead. In our organization at the Heil Group in Austin, we decided we needed to get really specific with this. So we developed the term nurture. And basically, we use the word nurture as a qualified lead. There are five set criteria we utilize to determine if that person meets that nurture standard. Just to share with you, our set criteria are these. They have to be motivated, which means real motivation. No, I'm just looking for a price, right? Their timeline has to be within 12 months. There has to be an opportunity for us to list the home right, to work with them, meaning they're not already engaged with a realtor. So motivation, timeline, has to have a selling opportunity for us as the agent. They also have to direct us when to follow up with them, meaning the call has gone well enough that they're saying, yeah, call me back in six weeks. And then lastly, we have to have their contact information, which is phone number and email. If it's a seller, the address of the home they intend to sell. Okay. Now we are very strict on this because again, we don't want junk being piled up into our CRM. So we look for those five key criteria. Okay. So now we've gotten the lead. Here it is. It's a great lead. It's actually a nurture now. Awesome. What do we do with it? This is where it's going to be important for you to develop the different categories within your CRM. And then determine from there, how is a lead followed up with? When I say categories, think of it like a sales funnel. Think of it as a pipeline, right? And determine, okay, they come in as nurture, then what? They stay in nurture status until they get converted into an appointment. Maybe this is just a phone number we're starting off with. A name of a name of a name. Where does it start? Because we can't classify it yet as a nurture, but we've got to put it in the system because we're working it out of the system. How do we classify this contact, right? 
So there's many different ways you can do that. Um, I have a system on my team as to how we do it. I'm happy to share it with you. But this is for this webinar, the purpose of this is just to give you a basic overview of what you need to have in place in order to su properly support an ISA OSA. Now, in telling you this, guys, I don't want you to think, oh, man, I don't have any of this done. I cannot get an ISA OSA. You can. I don't want you to also run into perfection paralysis to where you feel like everything needs to be buttoned up tight as a drum before you go. So much of this I found is learn as you go. You can absolutely start the recruiting process and hiring process for an ISA OSA tomorrow so long as that you recognize that these systems are going to be necessary to increase that ISA OSA's ability to convert and for you to get your full return on investment in that ISA OSA and you have a plan around implementing them over time. Okay. So another key fact factor of managing the lead is know who owns the lead at all times. What are the expectations of the pipeline and who are you speaking and, and are you speaking the same language as the rest of your team? So your agents, your ISAs, everybody needs to be on the same page as to how you work a lead from beginning to end, given all the different scenarios it can go through, right? So just think about any time you've talked to another agent who says, oh yeah, I've got a really good lead. We connected, we hit it off well. And then three months later, you ask them, how'd that go? And they say, you know, they went radio silent on me, right? We cannot leave it up to the agent or up to the ISA to feel out that lead and determine when they should follow up or the manner in which they should follow up. You need to come out with a system in place, a game plan of the lead follow-up process. Otherwise, you're risking losing money, losing your investment on those leads because they're not worked at a high level. And it, it's not because your ISA or agents being lazy often. Per the Harvard Business Review, we know most agents do not follow up past call attempt number two. They get uncomfortable, they convince themselves this person is being bothered by them, and they stop calling. And we also know that the largest answer rate happens at call attempt number six. So this is an example of us treating our um, lead gen source as a business, right, instead of just giving them carte blanche to do what they want. Because I see that happen with a lot of ISA OSA teams and they're not successful. And then they get upset at the model and thinking the model doesn't work. You have to have these systems in place to have it work at a high level. Okay, let me jump over to the chat box and see if I have any questions. If there are any questions, go ahead and type those in now. Let me just jump over there and see. Any questions? Also, I want to give you guys my contact information. Should you have any questions outside of this webinar? We put that in here. Okay. I'm not seeing any come through. Again, this is a new platform for us, so I'm not certain that you all have the capability of doing this. So I do apologize if that's the case. Uh, and again, that is my email address. So if you do have any questions, please, please, please feel free to shoot me an email uh, and I'm happy to answer those outside of the webinar. Okay, let me get back onto it then. All right, so managing the leads, models. Here's the real nitty gritty stuff. Here's where we're really looking to see what's gonna work for you or not. First of all, I should say before we even jump into the models, if you don't already have an admin or an executive assistant in some capacity, hire that person first before you get an ISA OSA. I feel it would be, some people ask me, can I get an ISA that does both? My, my reaction would be, it's unlikely. And the reason I say that is because the behavioral style you're looking for an individual to, to do your administrative work is largely different than the behavior style of a sales prospector, okay? Um, you typically want somebody organized, steady, conscientious uh, to do your admin duties. Your sales, it's a, it's a different breed of a person. So I, I don't see that working out well. You might have found that one chameleon that does it all and does it all really well, and that's awesome if you did more power to you. 
but right off the bat, I'd say probably not. So you want to get your EA or your admin hired first. And once you're there, then you can start exploring more so about ISA, OSA. So let's talk about the traditional ISA, OSA model. That's one person doing both types of prospecting, right? So what it looks like typically is you'll have somebody calling first thing in the morning, expired withdrawals, then doing their follow-up, or maybe have some for sale by owners in there too, then doing their follow-up. And then they log into all of the inbound leads that have come in and they start reaching out to those people. Any online registrations, sign calls, things like that. The pro, the the plus side of utilizing this model is it's easier to manage and train. You've got one person doing both things. The fewer people you have, the less complex your life will be. Communication increases exponentially with each team member that you add to your team. So it becomes more and more challenging the larger and larger your team can get in terms of management and communication. All right. Uh, the other pro for this is there's less lead supply necessary. You're only feeding one person leads. So you need less of them to sustain that individual. Okay. Here's the cons. Here's the, the pitfalls or the drawbacks, I should say. The first one would be juggling the leads, right? Um, what we know is for inbound leads, the buyers that are coming through, sign calls, uh, registrations, things like that. You have a small window of time to connect with them and to uh, be able to convert them. Basically, if you're not connecting with this lead within five minutes or less, you are 75% more likely to fail. Okay, because the statistic is five minutes or less, 75% conversion rate. If it's outside of that five minute window, good luck. Right. It just takes a it takes a dive in terms of their responsiveness. So when you're working and expired withdrawn at 8 a.m. making the outbound call and then you get a lead coming in at that same time, it's like, which one do you push pause? How do you go back and forth between the two? Right. Um, you typically are making a segment of your day. And by doing so, one of those two lead types is going to suffer. And it's less for me, it's less, I was saying this in a call earlier today, I care less about the, the ISA actually being able to juggle going back and forth and keeping their head on straight. I care more about the cost of my lead potentially uh, dying, right? D dying on the vine, just not getting worked at the highest level of efficiency that it can be. So that's my, my concern there. Um, the other concern too is when you just have one person doing both of those calls and they're by themselves, there's a lack of competition and camaraderie. Uh, they ju you just have that one ISA, OSA in that division. And it, sometimes they may feel as if the rest of the team doesn't appreciate or understand what they're doing uh, and, and can relate to um, their day in, day out grinding on the phone. So those are the typical pros and cons. The next model that we see is, again, the traditional ISA, OSA. However, you have one ISA and one OSA, or you just have one person for one role only. Meaning instead of having two people in the, in the department, an ISA and an OSA, you either just have an ISA doing only ISA work or an OSA doing only OSA work. So the benefits here are they're able to specialize their skill because they're only focusing on one type of lead source, which is uh, expired withdrawals, outbound prospecting, circle prospecting for your OSA, or the inside sales agent is just focusing on how they connect with buyers because that's typically who they're getting on those web registrations and sign calls, right? Um, the other benefit here is they have camar camaraderie competition. But again, that's if you have two, right? Not if you only have one. That's why I have an asterisk there. Easy to manage. If you just have the one asterisk there, it becomes a little bit more challenging when you have two. So those are both like, uh, they could go either way, depending on what model you have. They're able to focus on their specific area of your business. That's another benefit. So let's say, for example, you have a team, let's say you're a rainmaker and you have made it a mission that you only focus on sellers. That's it. You don't take, you don't work with any buyers. It's just you out there working with sellers and you sell, I don't know, let's say you're really gangbusters, sell a hundred houses a year. You have one buyer agent that you brought on 
and they're selling about 30 houses a year, right? You largely have an untapped market of buyers to work and your buyer agent can only work so many of them because they're busy. So you could easily bring on an ISA who is dedicated just to contacting your sphere. So maybe, maybe fleshing out some seller clients that way, but just dedicated to all of the inbound leads. So largely buyers. That is an, a, an untapped area of your business that they can have a hyper focus on. And maybe that's all you need. Maybe that's all you want. Maybe your goal is to continue to sell real estate, but grow your business and, and add to your bottom line by adding uh, three more buyer agents, right? It's, it's again, th these models are largely going to depend on what your goal is for your company. If you want to get out of production and have a, a massive business, then maybe it is hiring more ISAs, OSAs, each for their own independent um, focus, right? so that they can do more with their time. The negative parts of this is the more that you have, the more challenge it is to manage. And burnout, if they are just doing one type of call, making one type of uh, attempt, then they could burn out more easily, especially if they don't have any companionship or camaraderie. And then the biggest, the biggest con I would say for all of the traditional models is retention. So here's what we found. When we find rock star ISAs that are hungry and pushing hard, they're rock stars and they are not going to want to settle staying in an ISA OSA role that has a cap on their earning potential, right? So we found that a number of them want to move on within the organization, um, an agent or something else of that magnitude. So our big challenge with this model is keeping them in the position. Is it possible? Absolutely. Absolutely. You can find uh, ISA OSAs that are lifers, that they will do well in the role, and they are attracted to the nine to five schedule. They're attracted to the consistency. Uh, they like not working outside of that nine to five role. And they like not having to deal with fires, with any of the issues that you run across traditional sellers and buyers that they have. So are they out there? Yes. When we say they're one in a hundred, we literally mean you interview a hundred people to find that one person. So they're just more rare, but you, it is absolutely doable. Okay. All right. Now here's another model. Oh, no, sorry. Let me talk about the papers. Compensation for ISAs. This is based on our market, so you can base it off of yours. We pay them $2,500 a month, and we bonus them 5 to 10% of GCI or $300 to $400 per transaction. So in our market, 5% goes a long way because um, the you can't live in Austin for less than $300,000. So um, our 5% budget is healthy of GCI, you want to really examine your market and determine uh, what's going to make sense uh, based on the sales price, the average sales price that you and your team bring in. Uh, in some situations, it's a flat fee of $300 to $400 per transaction. Okay. All right. Here's another model. Junior agent. Okay. Let me tell you what a junior agent model looks like. It is where you hire an individual to come in. Uh, with the expectation that they're going to become an agent after completing a, a six month training program. During that six month training program, they are going to be calling, outbound calling for leads. Every nurture that they source, they're paid $25 per nurture. Okay. So, here are the pros and cons. First, it really helps with the issue of turnover and retention. We're bringing on an individual who is going to graduate to becoming an agent. We're embracing that natural turnover that we're experiencing. Secondly, it's offering healthy competition. We, we onboard about uh, four or five of these individuals at one time. It helps us weed out the ones that aren't going to fit. It helps them self 
self uh, select themselves to to be removed from the program, self identify. The cost is less expensive. Twenty five dollars per nurture is their pay. It's a paid training program. Outside of their daily calls, they're also being trained on everything, everything they need to be successful as a full-blown agent. Listing presentation, buying presentation, CMAs, contracts, um, all of that, okay? We find that when an individual can source a, uh, can source a lead, and carry that lead themselves all the way to appointment, they have a higher conversion rate. So I'm saying this and some of you are thinking, okay, what you're telling me, Katie, is if the agent calls for themselves, sets the appointment, goes on it and takes it, they're more likely to convert than if they had an ISA, OSA do it. Correct. You're probably thinking, well, then why would we ever hire ISA, OSAs if you're telling me I have a higher conversion rate with my agents? Here's why. Two reasons. One, your agents are going to get uh, are going to hit a, a point to where they're too busy and they can't add more to their plate. So the ISA is going to leverage that out for them. The second reason is what I have largely found, and I'm sorry if I offend anyone here, but what I have largely found is that agents aren't the best at follow up. That is an area where they um, lack discipline of of following up. So in my mind, it's like, okay, I can pay for all these leads for my agents and cut out the ISA because theoretically my agents are going to have a higher conversion rate, but not really if they're not following up, if they're letting those leads through the system. So that's another reason why we'll have an ISA OSA come in to work those leads for them and get them to the appointment set status and get them out there on it. Okay. In this system with our junior agent program, we monitor it at a really high level to ensure that they are following up. So we recognize that they do have a higher conversion rate. The con here, though, as you see in the bottom section, is that there there is a less number of home sales that they can make. They're they're tapped out. Um, They can't do more unless they utilize the help of an ISA OSA. Uh, The other con here is that you're constantly going to be recruiting right? Because in six months, when these guys turn into agents, you need somebody to be making the calls all over again. You're going to have more people to manage. A higher level of follow-up per agent is expected. So you got to have systems in place to manage it. Less number of sales over time, right? So each agent is probably going to sell less per month than they would if they were utilizing an ISA OSA because their time isn't leveraged as well. We're gonna talk about this a little bit more in this in the next slide too. And then cost. Okay, so earlier I said cost is a pro. Yay, you're only paying them $25 a nurture, woohoo. Okay, here's the challenge guys. When you have a brand new agent come in and you train them and you give them leads, they think you are the cat's pajamas. You're able to give them a lower split. Over time, as they become more experienced and more seasoned, they realize that they're not getting as much value as they did in the beginning. So what we do on our team to compensate for this is we have a tier of splits. Um, I can't remember offhand how it works out because I just know what tier I'm in. (laughs) But essentially, let's just say hypothetically here. Once an agent sells 50 houses with the team, then their split increases. Once they sell 70 houses, it increases further. And then they are maxed out at the highest split they can get once they sell a certain number of homes. And the idea here is that over time, like I mentioned, they're going to see less value from the team because they're no longer requiring as much education, training, right? And they're over here cultivating their own leads, essentially. If you had your agent being sourced leads from an ISA OSA, then you could get away, not get, I don't want to say get away. It's not a shamble here, but then you would be paying your agent a lesser split because you have to recoup the cost of sourcing that lead yourself. Does that make sense? Um, So that is kind of why cost is both on the pros and the cons of this model. Okay, now let's talk about a hybrid model. 
or sorry, compensation. Here it is. I talked about this earlier. $25 to nurture. I have splits here because those will vary over time based on their experience, right? You're going to have to increase it. Otherwise, you really run the risk of losing that agent. What's going to stop that agent from saying, well, I'll just go do this myself. You're not really offering me anything more that I can't do for myself. Um, hybrids and variations. So junior agent program with permanent ISA, OSA, I will tell you that is what we do at the How Group. Uh, all of our agents come in as junior agents, calling, setting their own, um, sourcing their own nurtures, setting their own appointments. If they haven't graduated to the, be a full-blown agent yet, they're setting the appointment for a senior agent on the team. They then shadow that senior agent to get that experience. We also have permanent ISA OSAs that are calling and handling inbound leads that will source those leads for more senior agents. Um, it can be set up as a reward system or just a split difference. So I'm a senior agent. I have uh, one of the highest splits on the team. If I were to take advantage of an ISA OSA sending me a lead, my split would then be decreased because of that lead source. Right. So that's how we have it set up. At any time I could go in and start getting leads from the team in that way. But my uh, if I were to once I close it, I would be writing a bigger check to the how group than I currently do for any of the leads I source myself. OK. Um, also, another thing to consider about your hybrid and variation is the lead follow up piece and the incubation appointment set. So maybe you have a team of extremely focused agents that are organized and on top of their stuff, but they just need a little bit more help getting the nurture set. Then you might want to have a system where your ISA OSA is nurture is sourcing the nurture and then passing it off to them and letting that agent follow up from there. Uh, maybe that is not the situation and you want your ISA OSA to incubate the lead all the way up to appointment set. Another variation that I have seen is on my team, we as soon as our um, OSA set an appointment for me, that then became my responsibility, that person, right? They, they showed up in my CRM, they got transferred to me, I am confirming the appointment, going on it, and taking the listing. If I didn't take the listing at that appointment, it's my responsibility to follow up with them and uh, to see it through. Some other teams, however, will kick that um, prospect back to the OSA that said it because they don't have confidence or that listing specialist themselves said, I can't keep up with this. I need your help following up with them after the appointment. Okay, so you could do it that way as well. What I will tell you guys, if you're thinking about hiring an ISA OSA, I think it's great. It's a model we use. I love it. But I will tell you guys, again, they're only going to be as successful as the systems they have in place and as talented as the agents are who are going on the appointment. Okay. I have a team right now that I'm coaching that we have, um, that I coach the director of lead gen. She's she's following the, the manual to a T. She's getting great results. Her her uh, OSAs are setting appointments, hitting their appointment goals at 20, 25 appointments a month. And she's saying, but it's not it's not showing up like the I'm looking at the GCI. I'm looking at the closed transactions and it's not there. The other key component of this program is you have to track the agents. You have to have a record of how many appointments are they actually going on, how many are canceling, how many are no showing, how many are they going on, how many are the agents successfully able to reschedule, because that'll happen. The uh, lead will call saying, I can't meet today, I need to cancel. It's the agent, and my, and my team, it's the agent's responsibility to reschedule it, to not let them cancel, to do our very best. Then from there, of those, how many are they taking? As a client, how many are they signing up? Are they getting to sign the listing agreement, the buyer agreement to work with them? Or whatever that looks like in your organization. I have a team I'm coaching also that says we don't make them sign buyer reps. Uh, we count them as engaged clients, meaning they're showing them property. Okay, that works for you. Great. So you really want to have something in place to measure the agent success. What we learned, what we learned is that her ISA OSAs are crushing it, setting appointments after appointments, but her listing agent has a 22% conversion rate of the appointments that she goes on, right? So 
when you're wondering, should I get an ISA OSA? Evaluate that. If your ISA OSA is going to start making calls to expire withdrawn for sale by owners and you have a business largely uh, based on repeat referral, if you have a bunch of calls that are come list me calls, hey, I'm so-and-so's friend. They said you did a great job. I want you to come out here and help me with my house. You need to really make sure that you as the rainmaker, the listing agent, or whomever you have in that position that's going to be going on these appointments are up to speed on being able to convert at that high of a level, right? It's a totally different appointment going on a expired withdrawn when you're up against six agents versus your mom's friend from church. So in order for you to make a successful program out of this, you have to make sure that your agents are right there on conversion as well. Otherwise, your ISA OSA isn't going to hit their own financial goals for the year as well as your own goals for the team. Okay, so you really have to consider your team goals as well as you're thinking of these different variations and different models, right? Um, our team is massive. We have teams across the country. So the junior agent program fits with it perfectly. We're constantly looking to recruit more agents. So we're constantly facing turnover. Your goal may not be as large. Totally fine. Right. You may just want to get to a place where you seventh level and step out of the day to day selling. So you might want more of a permanent ISA OSA role. Great. Fantastic. But these are all things that you need to think about. Now, what I would really encourage you to do with this is to get clear. So when I say get clear, what I mean is write it down. What does your org chart look like? What is your what is your financial goal? Because here's another element that we sometimes overlook when we're building our ISA OSA program. You want to build it so big and you say, okay, if I have one ISA setting 20 to 30 appointments a month and I have my uh, listing specialist taking and selling, oh, uh, let's say 20 on average, um, and then I've got my buyer agent. I've got, let's say, four buyer agents to this one listing agent based on their volume. Um, okay, then I'm going to net this amount of money. One thing we often forget here is when you decide to double your business, somebody has to be there to service it. <laughs> okay, so that means more cost and admin services as well. So make sure you factor that in as well, because then you might actually need more deals to come up with the net that you need to fund your lifestyle out of production. Okay. So really, really take a pen to paper, write this out and determine what specifically your goal is. And if it's going to be in alignment with these models, my guess is yes. It's just going to take some time and some work put into it up front, especially if your goal is to get out of production at some point. Okay. So um, that's all I have for this class today. Uh, let me go over and check again to see if by any way there's a chat function happening. Ah, so, okay. I see here the cool to group. Hi there. Um, what is your team's ISA OSA lead follow-up process? attempts and timeline. Okay. So ours is the 21 days of gain, which means over the, so this is if they've never answered the phone or they've answered it one time and then they've kind of gone silent on us. We will attempt over the course of 21 days, a mixture of phone calls, text messages, and emails to them. If they still don't answer after 21 days of constantly calling them. Oh, and by the way, we'll do it from various phone numbers. Utilize a company called Ring Central to pay for quote unquote fake phone numbers with the same area code um, to make those call attempts and text attempts. If over the course of 21 days, they still do not answer, we do not delete the lead. We put it in um, an archive. That's the category we created. How we came up with that name, I can't even remember, but it's called archive. And those are the list of numbers of people that went silent on us and didn't respond after 21 days of gain. Uh, we still call through the archive list at least once a month. Quick tidbit here. 
our company, the president is his name is Matt Potolsky. He joined the company shortly after I did. We trained him up, unleashed him on the phones. He called his focus at first was just calling the archive list because as he was getting new and experienced, we wanted to call him on um, the lowest value list we had. He sold 60 houses and I want to say 80% of them came from that archive list. So that's a testament to really working the lead through, not just finding out which I think a lot of us are doing that unintentionally, but we, we make call attempts, we get it in our mind, they don't want to talk to us, that's their way of saying no, and we just delete the number. Do your ISAs work from home or in the office with you? Uh, they work in the office with us. Do I have a problem with them working from home? No. Um, I'll tell you, the ISAs I, I uh, know firsthand have said they prefer working in our office with us um, because they get to play around. Um, Part of our company core values, one of our core values is um, fun. The word fun is incorporated in our mission. And so our office environment is a fun place to work. We have games, we have music, we have breakout sessions where we uh, will stop making calls to play a game. Uh, one of our more popular games is Name That Tune where somebody will compile like four songs and you have to guess what the song is just listening to the melody and whoever wins gets a prize. That's just one of our silly games we play. Uh, we have other games centered around our skills and enhancing them. So who can come up with the most different ways to ask for motivation, right? Um, what are the varying ways in which you can handle an objection? Things like that. So, we we really strive to have a fun office environment. But like I said, I wouldn't be opposed to somebody working from home. It's just you have to have a high level of trust and inspect what you expect there. Any other questions? Okay, awesome. Well, that's the webinar for today. I really hope this has helped you guys determine whether or not you want to utilize an ISA OSA in your business and giving you better perspective into what type of model you would like to strive for. Do I um, just real quick before closing it out? We started in our business with a traditional and then over time we shifted to the junior agent and then we have landed on a junior agent hybrid with a traditional. So just because you start one way doesn't mean you can't end another and, and whatnot. It's uh, it's definitely something that you can make your own. Uh, what protocol have you found successful after the agent has had the appointment other than updating notes and CRM as an ISA? This seems to be a growing issue. Great question. Okay, so what we did is we created a digital form set for our, our agents with drop down menus. So basically, what we learned with the agents is you have to make it as easy for them as possible. Okay, so, and I was an agent, so I will cop to this. I lacked organization skills, I was running all over the place. And when my ISAs would ask me how it went, it was hard not to take it personal and feel like they were judging me in, on a sense. So it, it just became a, a bit of a contentious issue for us. So um, basically what we did is there was a form set, a, a, a landing page that uh, all of us programmed into our phones and we saved it in our phones so it looked like an app but it was really just a website page. And what I would do is after each appointment, I would click it and it would be a drop down. I would just put the person's name, you know, John Smith, and then it was the drop down for the date. You click the date, the calendar pops up. And then what happened? Was it um, appointment gone on, listing taken, or appointment gone on, thinking it over, or appointment gone on, loss. And it was just that quick to upload. Uh, our director of lead gen would get it. And so they'd have real time data of what's happening on the appointments. And then every week we would have a scheduled meeting just to talk about it, to see what our conversion rate was, the specific 80%, 70%, whatever it was, and talk through the ones that I might've lost and see what I could have done better on my end. So it's about having a high level of accountability, but having those standards in place to be able to hold them accountable, having those systems in place to be able to measure their activity. Okay. So I hope, I hope that helps you, uh, Jessica, any other, any other questions and I'll message you. I for beauty 89. Okay. Well, then that's it. Um, I trust everyone ha ha got something out of today's webinar. If not, I do apologize. I'm happy to help you one-on-one -on -one 
outside of this, just please shoot me an email. Again, my email is Katie at Heil Real Estate. And I look forward to helping you any way I can. Thank you guys and, and have a great day.